can start. And then, uh, no, but it's, uh, maybe you just describe your observations uh, and this specific situation uh, that we created there. And what did you what did you observe? What uh, is the outcome of this unconditioned? I think. Uh, yeah. First, I have to qualify by saying that this is not a very healthy nest. But of course, as a ethologist, I'm interested also in other healthiness, as long as it's so because nests die, and one would also like to understand uh, what happens when they die. So I observed, for example, that there is no brood, there are no eggs, larvae, and pupae, which already demotivates the adults, not only from working but also from cooperating. And in fact, in such a situation, they are motivated to look for other options. Can I leave? Is there a better place I, I can go to? Or can I start my own nest? So, even though the food was provided, they were not taking it, because normally they take the food for the larvae. There are no larvae. And uh, there was one individual who was permanently sitting in the, in the nest, on the nest. That may be the queen, but we cannot be sure till we actually see the nest. So in that sense, this was what we would call a nest in decline. And if we keep the doors of the cage open, my prediction is that in a day or two they will leave. But if you keep the doors closed and force them to stay and feed them, etc., then they might start all over again. That is the diagnosis of this particular nest. Because normally I study very healthy nests. Hundreds of larvae, lots of pupae, lots of activity, lots of interaction. So this is a nest in decline. But maybe, so we could say it's in a critical state, yeah? in a decisive state, that uh, the option to stay might, might be true or to leave. In a sense, yes. However, what we observe, and this is somewhat frustrating to us, we always observe that the decline is extremely gradual. Unless there is a catastrophe, you know, there is a big predator attack or a big storm or something. But natural decline is extremely slow. Sometimes it can take weeks or months. We know it's declining. You know, it's like a patient. We know he's going to die, but he's not. So he stays in coma for months and months and months. So these nests sometimes remain like for a very long time. And uh, that's not surprising because in a situation like this, they also don't have many other options uh, because they are maybe they are old, and so they don't have many other options. So it's a very slow phase. So normally, when we say critical phase, we expect it to be short. This is very very slow. The decline is very slow. We are dealing with this critical zone in this project. So we also deal, are dealing, as we did in the workshop, with the term of criticality. Mm -hmm. So critical moments for scientists might be the interesting one because yeah. they are turning points. Yeah. So from an observational point of view, uh, how would you define the term critical? Okay. So the most interesting critical phase for these colonies, well, certainly interesting for us and I think also interesting for the wasps, is when one queen is overthrown uh, or voluntarily relinquishes and a new queen takes over. That's a very and that's the one we've been studying for many years. Both by, this doesn't happen very often. It doesn't happen when we want it to happen. So we simulate it. We go and remove the queen and to see how the next queen takes over. But we also have spent many, many hours, many, many students waiting to see whether we can witness the natural situation. And we have seen I think about at least 10 to 20 natural events. We've seen hundreds of simulated events, of course. And there, again, it's a bit variable, but it happens usually in a very short period of time, mm -hmm. one or two days. Sometimes the workers, especially the potential queen, detects that the old queen is declining and challenges her and uh, quickly the old queen loses and then there is a transition. Sometimes maybe the new queen is not really ready 
and requires some more time. So she is not challenging the old queen, even though the old queen is declining. But we see sometimes that the old queen provokes the new one by walking off. It's your nest. Ready or not, take care of it. I am leaving. She basically walks off. So that's the second kind of situation. There are other most interesting situations, right? The old queen thinks, I am still good. And the new one says, I am better than you. And then they fight. And then they fight. And this thing we have studied in some detail. So there, it depends on the relative strengths. It depends on the relative strengths. So we have seen situations where after an encounter, the new one realizes, you are right, you are still good, so I am going back to work. Or the old one realizes, you are much better than I thought, so I better leave. And once again, there is this intermediate thing where each one thinks they are better than the other, then they, they can even kill each other. In fact, at that stage, one of them can even die. Talking about... Um the global and the terrestrial and the new search movement by Bruno Latour, who has been also a visitor of uh, the CCS. Yes. Um, and uh, so Latour is criticizing the global, as he says, this is representing modernity, or this is very close to, moder to a modern concept. Mm -hmm. and then he says there are now political movements who are very much um, uh, going back to the old land, like uh, Modi or Trump, uh, who promise we set up borders again, yes. uh, we believe in nations, mm -hmm. and we want to have it as it was before. Mm -hmm. And uh, Latour proposes that as a third search movement, we have to become terrestrial. Mm -hmm. And Donna Haraway is also talking about finding a new approach towards the terra. Mm -hmm. that, we, that we are living on. Um, I think, I would assume you as a terrestrial person. If I, because you told me that um, uh, 40 years ago you had the decision either to become a molecular biologist and go to the US, which had, would have been a modern global yes. um, decision. Yes. But you decided to remain mm -hmm. in India and uh, to, to look for an object which is uh, of your interest, and that was the wasp. Yes. So that is a terrestrial attitude. Um, and uh, it's also a decision for observation. Yeah. Yeah. But I so. must say a little bit that I cheated a little bit, because I believed that what I am choosing may look not so modern today, but will be the real modern tomorrow and maybe I will help make it. So it's not so much reduction, rejection of modernity, but my desire to create a new modernity. So I'm not against modernity, but I would like to be the creator and not just the person enjoying what somebody else has already created. I always tell the, my students that the best strategy in science is to find a field that is not fashionable and make it fashionable. The normal tendency is to find what is fashionable and jump on the bandwagon. Which and is very others which do. is very counterproductive and I don't know why so many people automatically do this. Everybody does it. The funding agencies tell you, the journals tell you, professors tell you, oh this is a hot area, get into it. And I say this is a hot area. No, no longer. Let's do something which is not hot and make it hot. That is what I think we should be doing, and so it was a little bit in that uh, in that spirit. But uh, observation, yes, and uh, that certainly was very important. And if you, if you can give me a few minutes, I want to flag one issue about observation, which is uh, there is a lot of debate among scientists how to observe nature. There's one school of thought which says that there is no use in just observing. You must have questions in mind, you must have theories in mind, hypotheses in mind. Only then observation is useful, otherwise you are not a scientist. There is another school which says that if you have questions and theories and hypotheses, you are already biased. 
you must find out what is out there in nature with a completely open mind, with a blank slate. It would appear that these two are completely contradictory positions and they have been treated as contradictory positions and there is a lot of debate. The truth is that you actually need both of them. So I am not saying the usual cliche that the truth is somewhere in between. No, no, no. These are two extremes but you have to practice them alternately. You have to spend some time observing nature with a blank slate. No questions, no hypothesis, no expectations. Just observe. From that you then construct questions and hypotheses and theories. Now you go back and look at nature with this in mind. But you shouldn't do it for too long. Then you again turn around and say now I am going to observe without any questions. So we, you have to alternate between these two states of observation. Both are very important in science. One is none, neither of them is wrong nor right. Both are important. But you cannot do them at the same time. You must do them one after the other in repeated cycles. That Either is, or, yes. But in repeated cycles. Yeah. You go from one to the other. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the real trick in mm -hmm. um, Now you uh, you have a relation, you set up a professional relation to that species of a wasp. Mm -hmm. um, Opalidia marginata. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so, in a way, you made kin, like on a Haraway would say, yes. or companionship, species yes. companionship, or maybe kind of a symbiogenesis. Yes. I don't know. How would you describe your personal relation towards that species and its individuals? Today, it is very fashionable in evolutionary biology to speak of kinship as the proportion of genes shared. But this is a very recent and a very artificial concept. Kinship simply means familiarity, liking, resemblance. You can feel kinship to plants. You can feel kinship to your computer. So the original meaning of kinship is not genetic relatedness. And what is ironical is that even when it is genetic relatedness, it turns out that in most cases nobody measures genetic relatedness. They measure familiarity. They measure whom they like and they don't like. So throughout the animal and plant kingdom and human species, kinship has always been through what you might call a proxy. In some cases that may be a proxy for genetic relatedness. Other cases it is just for familiarity. In that sense you can have kinship towards anything. And I have been observing these wasps for a very long time now, almost 50 years, first as a hobby, then as a profession. And I would say I feel the greatest kinship certainly to this species than to any other species of living organism, living out humans. But even when it comes to humans, except my very close family and my students, I feel greater kinship to, to the wasps than to other human beings. This has obviously nothing to do with genetic relatedness. It is familiarity, it is something that you like, something that you want to be close to. And that you know, you know in a yeah, way. Yeah. Right. Uh, this again has pros and cons. There are people who believe that you should never get very emotionally close to the organism you are studying because you will be biased. And others feel that unless you really feel that, you don't really understand anything. Again, I think these are not two opposites, they are not two right and wrong. You must be able to combine both of these things. But to leave it as an opposite as well. Yes, yes, yes. Not leave it as it an opposite, it. but yeah, it's re reflect it. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. um, the critical zone deals with the vulnerability mm -hmm. of the living ecosphere. Um, now, uh, and that has to do also with the vulnerability of species. Uh, yes. A lot of species die out. Yes. Yeah. And uh, how would you feel if uh, if the wasp would die out someday? What? It's an um, emotional question. You know, or, um, also a question of kinship or whatever. Well, luckily these things happen on a very very long time scale. So unless we interfere 
most of these species are not likely to disappear for a very long time. Certainly not in the lifetimes of individuals. Maybe in the lifetime of our species, but maybe even not. So, you, of course, we can do something to exterminate. We have exterminated so many species of birds and frogs and even insects. If that happens, I would really feel very, very, very hurt and very sad. And, uh, maybe even more sad than losing a family member because you're losing the whole species here. It's not one wasp. So if the Propylidia marginata becomes extinct in my lifetime because of human activity, for me that would be worse than losing any human being close to me. Worse than. But if we don't do anything, then in course of time, things will change. And very often, species don't just disappear. They evolve into something else. They give rise to something else. That, in a sense, would be a happy occasion. Right? Like having grandchildren. <laughs> so that so it's a very nuanced question, and it depends on, on the context. So we, for example, because of our own researchers, we take a lot of precaution to make sure that we do not deplete the populations, even in Bangalore. So we don't collect from the same place. We don't collect all the nests in a given place. We Sometimes if we need only the adults, we leave the nest behind. If we need only the nest, we leave the adults behind. At the end of the experiment, we create conditions for the wasps to rebuild a nest, start all over again. So we try very hard to make sure we are not responsible for a decline in the population. But it's very easy to neglect this and create a decline. It's very easy for us to, to create that critical zone where things will become extinct. Certainly, it's very easy for us to make sure that these wasps are almost non-existent in Bangalore. Very easy. We would work very hard to do the opposite. What is their contribution towards ecology? These wasps and other social wasps are all carnivorous. Their main food is other insects. And to that extent, they maintain a balance of other insect populations. And if these become extinct, then other insect populations will grow up, which will include pests and other things that we don't want. Every species has a role in the chain, in the network, to maintain the final balance. And you can maybe destroy, destroy one, but if you destroy a certain minimum number, then the whole system will just sort of collapse. Not just these species, but that's the role that these kinds of species play in the, to maintain a balance. But actually, one of my former students is trying to even use these artificially to for pest control, for controlling pests in agricultural crops. So he places these boxes around the fields and monitors uh, how much pest, and there is some evidence that they actually help. Mm -hmm. Today is your last day at. IISC or at CCS? No, 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 no. no it's not, not my last day at all. Okay. In fact, today is nothing special. Okay. It just continues. That what is going to be different between today and tomorrow is from tomorrow I will have even more time for research because okay. I will have no administrative duties. Yeah. Otherwise, there is no other difference. But so it's I will uh, not be signing checks anymore. Yeah. But I'll be signing research papers. <laughs> Which is good. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only difference. But there is a slight difference mm -hmm. and. I, I just want to talk about time. Mm -hmm. Since uh, yesterday on this chair we had um, a geologist mm -hmm. uh, from Earth Science Lab yes. and he's doing uh, research on the inner core of the Earth yes. and on the magnetic field mm -hmm. of the Earth. And what I found surprising is that he said uh, Mars once had such a magnetic field and it disappeared sometime mm -hmm. and that's why most probably there is no life on Mars because the Earth needs the magnetic field in order to be protected and in order to set up something what we could consider the critical zone. And then he said, it's a, it could disappear, the magnetic field, within 20,000 years, mm -hmm. which is, compared to the whole lifespan of the Earth, a very, very short very time. Short. So what do you think, how long, how long do you think in advance for the human species and for the Earth, what is a reasonable life or time span to, to think in advance? One, two generations, like we have children, grandchildren, maybe grand-grandchildren. Um, 
again, this is not a question which can be, can be answered. How long will we be responsible for, for Earth? At least as long as the Earth has existed before we came, which is 4.5 billion years. We must be responsible for at least for the next 4.5 billion years, I think. Nothing less than that. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>